Welcome to our next discussion. This is NIL and the Road to Equity for Women in College Sports. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sport. It is Front Office Sports. It is my honor to have Jay Lee English here. Uh, she is the head of Women's Basketball Division at Clutch Sports Group, and we're going to have a great discussion. So Jay Lee joined Clutch earlier this year, earlier in 2022, uh, she was at Octagon, Rock Nation. Overall, just a true trailblazer in the sports industry. She represents some of the most elite talent in women's basketball right now. Jay, you were a track star yourself back at uh, the University of South Carolina and continuing to break barriers every day throughout all of sports, female athletics, and beyond. So without further ado, welcome, Jay Lee. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um when you name all of those things, I'm like, but that, I, that's not me. I'm just me. I'm just here doing my job. But, you know, funny enough, I'm actually at my alma mater right now, University of South Carolina, where I ran track um, with some of my NIL athletes. So um, it's it's funny to, to be doing a Title IX and NIL conversation at the place that 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 brought me here, you know. Yeah, no, it's it seems like it's meant to be. It is. <laughs> so then why why don't we get into it and, and have a conversation, especially right now? It's really interesting because and I think this is one of my questions for later. But in general, right now, it's such a sea change across this whole space. And you've seen it before. You've seen it now. So I'm really looking forward to, to all of the insight that uh, you have to share today. Thank so, you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so with that, um, let's talk about your time at South Carolina. We're talking about college sports. It's been around 20 years since you graduated. And what do you think about this whole moment moment that we're having right now? You know, all the developments with NIL for college students. Um, it's it's a, a groundbreaking moment in sports uh, across the board. Um, there's been just... Uh, so much innovation. Um, it's it's pushed the equality conversation forward, um, and it's quite frankly turned the NCAA on its ass, which it needed to. And it's pushed evolution, and and I think we're going to see a lot more growth within the space as well. Um, I remember when I was a long, long time ago running track and be way before NIL we could barely even get jobs because you could only make a certain amount of money without losing your scholarship and your eligibility. So to have this moment for all of college athletes, which I think was very long overdue, um, it's, it's given them the power to take control of their brand, um, to give back to their communities in a different way, um, and, and to make a little money. Yeah, we all have to survive. So it's uh, it's definitely I think a lot of people are really happy about these changes. Like you said, it feels long overdue. And in fact, in one week, it is um, it's a one year anniversary, uh, July 1st. And so I'm wondering, what do you think about the first year in particular? Um, would you what are some things that you'd like to see different in year two? Uh, it's a big hot conversation right now between this is what's great about it, but you have the critics speaking out. And uh, where do you think this needs to go to continue to be uh, reach its potential as like a part of college athletics? Um, it's funny, a year ago when we, I think it was, um, I think it was a USA basketball camp and we were all getting ready to send everyone to Tokyo and um, I'll even say like, it's been on my radar for a very long time. I didn't realize how disruptive immediately it would be. Um, I remember the law passing and then next thing, you know, getting a million phone calls and athletes reaching out, um, coaches reaching out about, you know, getting their players representation and just even any advice. And I think it was, you know, it's still a very new um, space. I think on a, on a brand level, it's, you know, brands now have to figure out, you know, where they're going to find that budget space, but then also the storytelling and marketing piece for, for amateur athletes. Um, 
which is very important, uh, especially when you're trying to, you know, I know for, for myself and, and for Clutch, you know, our, our one thing that's really important to us is, is the authentic organic marketing and making sure that, um, you know, the players, the players that you work with are being authentic for themselves and then working with brands that actually are purposeful and, and purposeful marketing. Um, but then there's also the education piece of now you have, you, you, you can build your brand now and, and whatever that means to whomever I'm, I'm, you know, super lucky to work with players that are really, really into their communities and want to give back. But, um, it's an educa education piece as far as, you know, social media wise, what you can and cannot post and how to put yourself out there to, um, the financial literacy part where you're making money now. So you have to figure out, Oh, I've got to put this money aside for taxes. Do I start an LLC? Do I do all these things? So all of these conversations are happening, um, much earlier than they usually are. Uh, and I think it's only to the benefit of the athletes, um, just to, to really be able to be their own business. And, and so in year two of NIL, do you see all of this basically improving, getting tighter when it comes to, there's a lot of conversation about, does everyone realize what taxes are going to be like? But year two, everyone involved will understand that. There will have been more you know, case studies to look at what works and what doesn't. Um, but do you think that NIL is here to stay? There may be some regulations to come, but this is the way of the future despite some Absolutely. of Absolutely. I think it's also important for the schools as institutions to implement the education piece as well when it comes to taxes and, and negotiating your own contracts if you don't have representation and, and realizing what what your actual value is and making sure that you're not being taken advantage of. Um, but I also think that there will be, you know, there, each school is different. Um, for instance, you know, I worked, I worked with a bunch of players from South Carolina and their rules were pretty strict compared to everybody else's. And I think coming into year two, that's going to change because they're also realizing it's a recruiting tool and a recruiting piece for them. And the harder it is for them to get athletes and for them to do NIL deals, um, the harder it is going to be for them to get those top tier athletes, um, but then there's also the the booster side of it where, you know, boosters are now offering up money and millions of dollars to certain players. Um, and and that's going to have to be regulated at some point, too, because guess what? Guess who's not going to get that money? The school. Mm -hmm. um, I think the schools are really going to have to figure out their their financial how, how they're going to redo, you know, getting money from boosters from sponsors because those sponsorship dollars that usually go to the school will now be kind of divvied up to athletes as well. So um, I can definitely see that happening. And I think even when it comes to like getting scholarships and, and what that means, I can see that changing too on, on the school side. Awesome. Well, looking forward to see how these things play out, but I think uh, it's really great that we're at this moment and getting started. Uh, specifically, you're so close to women's basketball, it seems to be kind of like a landmark, groundbreaking moment for the sport. You can't deny the viewership is up, the live attendance is up, there's this surge in interest. Also, just looking specifically at NIL, so many of the deals, so many of the biggest deals, women's basketball players. Um, what do you think of this moment? Why is all of this coming together at this point where all of a sudden we're seeing unprecedented interest in the WNBA in uh, women's college basketball. Um, if anyone can make some sense of it and explain it to a broader audience, it would be you. Uh, so behind the scenes with your insight, what do you make of this? Um, I think it's many reasons. The first is the visibility. It's, it's in front of us now. It's on ESPN. It's on CBS Sports. We're seeing more games. We're seeing these women front and center playing their game. Um, but it's also the women. Um, if, you, if you haven't been paying attention, 
they have been front and center when it comes to any social justice issue. And, and, and that has been a big part of the visibility that they're getting. Um, and then, and then it's the storytelling. I think we're starting to, you know, the more stories and, and, and personal information that you can know about players humanizes them. Um, and, and journalists are starting to really tell those stories and dig deeper and not just, you know, telling the surface level story of, um, you know, where they came from or whatnot. But honestly, I'll say, even as someone in marketing, when I'm recruiting an athlete or whatnot, and I'll say now that NIL has, um, this legislation has happened, we're starting much, much sooner. And storytelling didn't really happen until they went to the pro level. And that was even then iffy. And especially if you were black, storytelling wasn't happening. Um, so I think the women also shaking tables and, 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 and making a stance um, and speaking up about the in inequities as well has also brought light to, to women's sports and also to basketball because I think, you know, basketball is probably one of the more visible women's sports as well. Um, you don't really, you know, other than maybe soccer, um, you don't see a lot of softball or track and field. And, and I think also with the frequency of basketball and, you know, there's a season, of, you know, every year and there's um, a long season. So I think those are like kind of the top reasons why women's basketball has kind of risen to the top. So working at Clutch, working closely with, you know, an incredibly powerful and influential agent in Rich Paul, and you all also making a commitment to women's basketball and you running that division, representing so much talent, whether it's, um, you know, South Carolina, Leah Boston, or even in high school with, you know, Judea Watkins, you have a real visibility on this. You're leading Clutch's strategy. What is the sentiment with uh, Rich Paul with Clutch in general, like we see all these headlines, but I guess if you could take people inside the office and, you know, when you all as an agency think about women's sports, what, what is the conversation? Well, um, first and foremost, you know, Clutch is not your traditional agency. And I think that is why they have been so successful is um, they have evolved with the times. It's not a super corporate agency where you don't see people who don't look like you. And you don't, um, the conversations are always needle pushing, con moving conversations. Um, but also you have the support. And I will say on my end, as far as when it comes to women's sports and whatnot and working in this field for a while, there's a lot of explaining that you have to do to even get something done um, because it's women's sports and they don't make this much money and, and whatnot. And it's honestly the first time that I've worked at a place where they've truly been like, we trust you, do what you need to do. We support you. Um, let us know what you need. And, and my women are treated equally which is not the case everywhere. It, it may s seem like that, but it's not, mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to resources. You know, like they've literally thrown every single resource that I could possibly need. And, and that's really important because other places that I've been or other places, a lot of the times when you're working in women's sports, and I'm sure anyone can attest to this, it's you doing every single job because they don't want to give up the resources and they don't want, Oh, it's another salary or it's another this, or it's another that. And so you find yourself doing the PR, the marketing, the client servicing, all of those things where again, at clutch, it was like, what do you need? How can we help? Let's really dig deep into storytelling and the give backs and all of those things. And, and really getting to know the players um, like they like coming to the office. 
you any any day of the week you can be in the clutch office and anyone could be in there from Aaliyah Boston to Zach Levine to whomever um, because it's a very warm atmosphere um, and at the at the risk of sounding like a cliche it's it's a true true family atmosphere as right, so, well I, I love getting that that detail from you like that's part of why we're doing this uh, I think that's such an important part of understanding all these things could be happening but there's still little things inside of the agencies how we allocate resources yeah. all of these things that are going to ultimately make a difference and they're they're truly inclusive like part of it and I, and you don't always want to have to lean on the men but they have a bigger platform sometimes and part of it is making sure that the women are included so that they can share in the visibility and it's not it's a no it's not even a discussion at clutch um which i think is also a big part of it where they all know each other and get to know each other and it's not very siloed where you have your client over here. I have my client over here. We are literally, we do as much as we can together. And if, you know, Asia's in town playing the Sparks, we all go to the game, mm -hmm. you know, and we all sit courtside and we all support. Um, so I was going to ask about Asia, by the way. I mean, 2020 WNBA MVP, one of your clients, uh, also South Carolina. Why? Why is your school such a powerhouse? Like we we have to have that conversation. You got the MVP winning the chip. You're from there. Like, please maybe share some insight. I want to talk about some of the nice things that uh, Dawn said about you. But well, honestly, I was actually going to say that I have nothing to do with it. But um, I will. I would give that as far as basketball powerhouse. That is all Dawn Staley right there. Um, she is a special person, has a special relationship with her players. She fights with her fights for her players. Um, and she speaks up for them. She speaks up for them, not to mention, um, you know, people want to play for her. And she has literally built such an amazing program to where I'm like, they're looking crazy for the next five years, you know? Yeah. After even after, you know, the Aaliyahs and the Brie Beals and all of those players leave. Um, they just keep coming in. They keep coming in. And I think it's really just the beginning. Honestly, it, it started with, the, with, you know, the 2017 championship team and, um, and they're just building on that. And South Carolina is a destination spot. It's a destination spot now where, you know, if you know, if you're going to go to this program, you're going to win. They're, they're building that winning, um, that, that winning culture, much like, the old, like much like Connecticut had and the Tennessees and whatnot. It's, I, I truly think it's, um, it's, it's their time. Yeah. It's really, it's really fun to watch. And, um, you know, Don Saley had some nice things to say about you when you made this move to clutch uh, specifically, you know, I love that she talked about how meaningful this move is for black women and the fact that in agencies, and with the type of role that you have, you don't, do not see that type of representation. And how would you like to see the NIL space evolve for Black women, um, you know, specifically? And just looking at how we take something that's for, for women, that's changing the entire conversation, but then also look, you know, disabled women, LGBT, you know, Black women, how do you look at the different identities with within a larger group and um, understand how you approach that? Um, as far as, I'm, I'm not understanding, as far as approaching NIL or? Yeah, um, NIL and sports. And just when, when Dawn Saley says something like about how meaningful your well, movie and the representation that it gives, what do you want to see for representation going forward? In the, in the I think um, especially, especially with NIL, it has kind of blown the doors open to almost anyone, which is, I think, more, it's, it's good and bad, but anyone can do it now. All you have to do is, is build that relationship with the player. I know for myself, like a lot of the time, and even still now, um, because I'm a black woman, it's, I'm either the assistant or the manager or the, the helper or whatever. 
And sometimes you got to remind them like, no, honey, I did this deal. I did this deal. I'm not, you know, um, we've been put in a box for so long where um, it's, we are now at a place where those, those, the gatekeepers are no longer there and it's, and it's wide open. So I, I definitely see black women and men, honestly, um, really rising up in this, in this space, because at the end of the day, those are who our clients are, you know? Um, I couldn't imagine if my clients were represented by a man. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I just can't. Um, granted, I do have all women, but there are things that matter. There's things that matter when you're, you know, on set. And one of our most important things for me and my clients is like, I want to make sure there's people who look like us on set. If not, we're not coming. Um, there has to be representation. There has to be, um, and, and, and when I say our representation, I mean, not just the PA or the assistant or whatnot. It, it needs to be the director or the photographer, or hair and makeup, like all of those things, we need to have representation. Um, and we make sure of that. And, and I know, I know I do. And, um, and it's important. It comes and down I, to like lighting on sets, you know, exactly, you know, different skin tones and all those type of things are really important. I want to ask uh, one more question before we wrap up. And also anybody who's in the chat and the comments, this is your chance to get in a question or two uh, for Jay Lee before we get out of here. But one of the most pivotal moments this year, there was a landmark equal pay agreement with U.S. men's and women's soccer. Uh, what did you think of that news? And just how does that inspire you about where this entire movement is headed and where sports are headed overall? It's, it's very inspiring, but it's about damn time. Honestly. Um, I think it's definitely um, something that has pushed the needle forward. And I, and I definitely praise the players association, the women's soccer union, the WNBA union, because all those unions work together for equality um, and for equity. Uh, but it was, it was a landmark deal. And, and at the end of the day, it's, I hope we've learned something from it. I hope we've learned that, um, you know, this, I think this, this lawsuit had been going on for what, like five years or something. Um, the women were the more successful team, uh, and still didn't make as much as the guys did. And that's, I'm, how, who, how does that make sense? How does that make sense? Um, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, and I will say even with social media, with, um, with NIL as well, uh, it's, it's giving us a voice and a platform to call out the inequities as well and to use our voice. And I think it's only up from here and, and, you know, the, the women who um, fought for what was right should be commended. Um, and those, be those behind them should always know what was done before them. Um, I mean, just this, us having this conversation, there's, there's gonna be a time when, you know, hopefully soon, the younger generations aren't even going to have these conversations about women and men and equities and whatnot, they're not going to know of a world where women's basketball or soccer was not on TV or not getting, um, you know, equal treatment. Like those days are coming. It's, it's, it's taking a minute, but, um, it definitely gives you hope. It gives, gives me hope. Um, and it, and it just always pushes that conversation of equity forward at all times. Absolutely. Um, I'm really excited to see where this is going. I'm really, uh, you know, excited to see what Clutch does, everything you do with women's basketball. I know I live in L.A. I'm trying to take my daughter to the Sparks games this summer. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we there's a lot, a lot to be done, a lot of exciting things to look forward to. And I really appreciate you sharing these insights, yeah. these new learning. One thing I do want to say, though, is I want people to pay attention to where they're spending their money, too, because if the brands that you are spending your money 
are not supporting women or are not about equality, then you don't need to spend their money there. And that's where you hit them, take their money away. So don't support those brands that are not pushing our society forward. Absolutely. Yeah, you. I wish that we could talk for a much longer time. You got so many mm-hmm. interesting things to say. Uh, this has been really great. This has been amazing. Okay. Women's sports, NIL, clutch. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation today. I really appreciate you just taking the time to fill us in on this. You know, very special day, fifty years of Title Nine. Um, thank you so much. My pleasure.